Ah, hello, dear friends, and welcome back to this second installment of the Chronicles of the Age of Chivalry, Edward I. In the first part, we'd just gotten up to the point whereby Edward had completed his conquering of the Welsh nation. And now we are going to look at law and disorder. Let's start first of all with a bit of chronicle from a, from a chronicler of the time, 1279. On the 25th of January, Pope Nicholas III exercised his full authority, conferring the See of Canterbury upon John Beckham, a Franciscan friar and a supremely learned man, then dwelling at the papal court. For some time the Franciscan refused, but he was con finally consecrated. Unwillingly, it was said, on the 12th of March, he was set out set out for England on a convenient date. In early May, King Edward I crossed over to France to take possession of the county of Ponthieu, which he was claiming on the basis of the hereditary right of his queen, Eleanor of Castile. When he'd successfully completed his business and all had paid him homage, he returned to England before the 24th of June. John Peckham, newly appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, arrived shortly before him. During the same period, Edward I had proclaimed an edict throughout England to the effect that clipped money should no longer be circulated, nor should anyone be forced to accept it. In addition, he designated a small number of places in the kingdom, in towns and cities, where the money could be exchanged. For each pound of the current non-current coin, an extra sixteen pennies were to be paid for the exchange, and people would receive one pound of an unclipped coin. On the 21st of May, the regulation of clipped coy came into force, and indeed, within a short time, no one would consider accepting it. At the same time, a statute, the statute of Mortmain was wildly, widely proclaimed in England, which the king had drawn up on the advice and with the general assent of his nobles. According to his statute, in the future, no one could sell lands, revenues, or possessions to the clergy, nor make a donation of them, though it was permitted that any cleric should receive or accept any secular person's lands, revenues, or possessions by deed of gift, coalition, or purchase. That's interesting. The separation of church and state there occurring in 1279 and divorcing the financial elements of the church to the economic elements of the state. Which brings us now on to law and disorder. The Somerset Roll, one of the hundred rolls in the Royal Inquiry into Landholding, carried out in 1279. It was more detailed and thorough than any survey since the Domesday Book. Wonderful old scrolls here, isn't it, with all their old bindings? For the first two decades of Edward I's uh, reign, witnessed a great surge of governmental energy. The king started in 1274 by instigating countrywide investigations into the usurpation of royal rights and lands following the Civil War of the 1260s and into abuses by local officials. The largest such undertaking since the Domesday Survey nearly 200 years earlier. As in 1086, the information was provided by sworn juries of local men, recorded into rolls which were later called the Hundred Rolls after the local government districts or hundreds that they covered. As a result, the first statute of Westminster was enacted in Parliament in 1275. Its many detailed clauses tried to deal with the abuses the investigations had revealed. From 1278, proceedings were held before royal justices in the counties against lords who were thought to have usurped royal jurisdiction. When they were asked by what warrant, Q warranto, they had held these rights, many could not provide documentary evidence to support their claims. And in 1290, the government had to agree to accept as valid claims which had been continuously exercised since Richard I's secession in 1189. The agreement was embodied in a statute and came towards the end of a period in which there was a great proliferation of statute law in Parliament. Although Edward has been called the English Justinian as a result, after the 6th century emperor who reduced Roman law to a uniform code, the title is misleading. Edward and his ministers had no intention of codifying the law, rather legal points were clarified and grievances of landlords, merchants of the king himself were dealt with. The king is unlikely to have been concerned with the details in the statutes which were drawn up by administrators like Robert Burnell, his chancellor, and judges like Ralph of Hingham. In 1285, the government attempted to improve peacekeeping by stipulating that all men over the age of 15 should hold specified arms and be ready to use them under official direction to maintain law and order. Two years later, in 1287, keepers of the peace were appointed in the counties to supervise 
besides this militia. However, there was no improvement in order, and on the contrary, after 1294, in the prevailing atmosphere of war, lawlessness in the countryside increased. New commissions of justices were therefore appointed in 1304 to 5 to deal with offenders. Their sessions were known as trail and inquiries after the gangs of men armed with staves who terrorized the population. Many were soldiers who had fought for the king in his wars against the Welsh, Scots and French and were now sheltering in his forests. Edward's wars outside England finally disrupted life within the country. Got a lot of chronicling here. So 1281 from Christmas until early February 1282, there was bitter frost and heavy snow, the like of which even the old and the aged of that day had not experienced before in England. The five arches of London Bridge and many other bridges besides collapsed under the pressure of the ice. The River Thames was frozen solid all the way from Lambeth to the King's Palace at Westminster, and people were able to walk across without getting their feet wet. Fish died in the ponds and birds starved to death in the woods and fields. Wow, I mean, to be that cold that the River Thames is frozen solid is quite amazing considering how large a body of water it is with the currents. 1282, in this tenth year of King Edward's reign, at dead of night on Palm Sunday, 21st of March, Clewellyn, Prince of Wales, and his David brother, um, brother David, infested Rutland and Flint with a large army, and demolished any other royal strongholds which were they were able to overrun. At a warden, the Welsh forces captured Roger Clifford, a noble and renowned knight, whom they sent wounded and in chains to Snowdonia. After they had killed most of the garrison, and with no warning, and slaughtered in their beds both the young and the old, women and children alike, they then devastated a large area of the marches. Scarcely able to believe reports of these events, Edward I dispatched the barons of the Exchequer and the justices of the King's Bench to Shrewsbury to enforce the laws of the realm. He himself assembled an army and subdued Wales east of Snowdonia. To the earls, barons and others, including numerous Gascons and Basques sent from overseas who had supported him loyally, he granted many of the lands which came into his hands to be held by them and their heirs forever. As his next step, the king oversaw the construction of a large bridge made of boats across the tidal stretch of the River Conway, not far from Snowdonia. Subsequently, when some of the king's knights crossed this on a sortie, they were thrown into panic by the approach of a large and menacing band of Welshmen. In an unsuccessful attempt to retreat to the island of Anglesey, the knights drowned ignominiously. The Welsh, attributing this not to misfortune but to a miracle, urged their prince to act boldly and without fear, since according to the prophecy of Merlin, he would soon be crowned with the diadem of Brutus. So Llewellyn collected a large force and came down to the lowlands, living his brother David in the mountains. Edmund, heir of the late Roger Mortimer, Lord of Wigmore, with a company of marchers, fell upon Llewellyn's men, of whom they killed a large number without any losses of their own. In this skirmish, Prince Llewellyn's head was cut off. It was taken to London and displayed for a long time, crowned with ivy on a stake at the tower, where many years earlier Llewellyn's father Griffith had fallen and died of a broken neck. The Welsh, alarmed and confused following the death of their prince, surrendered all the strongholds in Snowdonia to King Edward I. Rishangar accounts a two conflicting epitaphs to the Prince of Wales. Two monks wrote many uh, two monks wrote verses in memory of Clewellyn. One, a Welshman, wrote thus Here lies the scourge of England, Snowdonia's garden and shore. Clewellyn, Prince of Wales, and character most pure, of modern kings the jewel, of kings long past the flower, for kings to come a pattern, radiant in lawful power. The English monk wrote as follows Here lies the Prince of Errors, a traitor and a thief, a flaming, a flaring firebrand the malefactor's chief, the wild Welsh evil genius who sought the good to kill, dregs of the faithless Trojans, and source of every ill. And so the king, having gained the upper hand, subdued nearly the whole of Wales, a long period of peace followed. The Worcester analyst describes the rising against Angevin rule in Sicily, known as the Sicilian Vespers here. Charles of Anjou, king of Apulia, Calabria, and Sicily, lost the greater part of Sicily in the spring, 1282, after the Sicilians rose against him and many of his people were killed in a surprise attack by Peter III, king of Aragon. Peter III claimed these realms by hereditary right because he married Constance, the daughter of Manfred, whom the Roman church had deprived of the kingdoms. Ignoring papal prohibition, 
Persians, the two rival kings reached an agreement that each should bring 100 knights to the plains outside Bordeaux on a day to be named, there to fight a tournament for the kingdoms. When the day came, however, the agreement was ineffective because Charles brought too many knights to the encounter. I mean, couldn't they have just said, you guys get back home and we'll keep the ones that were here? Maybe they were intimidated. In 1283, on the 28th of March, the King of England's officials went armed and on horseback to every place where they reckoned they would find money which had been collected for the tenth of the Holy Land. Any such money which they found they carried off, but they found none here in Worcester Priory. On the 9th of May, a convocation of all the leading churchmen of the province of Canterbury was held in London. The Archbishop and his suffragans promised the King, who was still in Wales, a specified sum of money to be raised among themselves, but the religious orders and the secular clergy, already much burdened, refused to cooperate in this. On the 25th of November, having subjugate, uh, subjugated Wales totally, the King came to Worcester to visit the shrine of St. Wolston, whom he held in particular devotion. A nobleman by the name of John Giffard granted land outside the walls of the city of Oxford with other estates to support thirteen monks of his choice from Gloucester Abbey because he wished that Benedictine monks should offer prayers perpetually for his soul and that of his late wife, Matilda Longsby. King Edward I directed that a mighty castle be built at Conway at the foot of Mount Snowdon. David, brother of the recently bearded Llewellyn Prince of Wales, was captured by the king's men, together with his wife, his two sons, and his seven daughters, and was tried subsequently by the magnates of England. He was a fermenter of evil, a most vicious dementor of the English and deceiver of his own race, an ungrateful traitor and a warmonger. The death of a traitor is indeed shameful. David was dragged at all, his tail through the streets of Shrewsbury, then hanged and finally decapitated. Afterwards his body was hacked into full portions, his heart and intestines were burned, and his head was taken to London to be slayed on a stake at the tower next to his brother's head. The four quarters of his headless corpse were dispatched to Bristol, Northampton, York and Winchester. That's nice, isn't it? What did your town get last week? I saw a big shipment. Oh, we got a Welshman's torso. Nice. A large piece of the cross of our Lord, called Crosnieth in the Welsh language, was among many famous relics handed over to King Edward's the first, and the crown of the renowned Arthur, once King of Britain, was also given to King Edward, along with other jewels. Thus the glory of the Welsh people, reluctant subjects to the law of England, passed by God's providence into English hands. Death was such a familiar figure to medieval illustrators that these Tells him an extraordinary calendar of death is perhaps not so surprising. Children die below left. A mother and her newborn child die below and far below cattle giving up the ghost and die. That's uh, rather maudlin, isn't it? Rather grim. Here is Carnarvon. Look at that. Beautiful. Absolutely stunning. A home and garden as well as a fortress. So well and built a, a garden there, and its military importance was softened by its use as a royal family residence. But life was precarious even for the king's children. The record of early deaths may have been partly caused by continually travelling and frequent exposure to new infections and diseases. So Queen Eleanor of Castile was about 50, when she died of malarial complications in 1290, after a life devoted to travel and pregnancies, blessed with an unusually happy marriage to Edward I. I love the use of the word unusually there. She had accompanied his progresses through England, France, Spain and the Holy Land, where she wailed so loudly when he was wounded by a Muslim assassin's poisoned dagger that the surgeons ordered her from the room and was still travelling with him when she took to her deathbed. In the intervals of this journey, she'd borne him 16 children. Wow, that is a painful and exhausting, I'm sure. Nine of whom died either at birth or in infancy. Even worse. Her favourite son, Alfonso, lived only 12 years. And of these six survivors, the future Edward II had a robust constitution which resisted his enemies' attempts to cause his natural death by starvation, ill-treatment and deliberate infection. Four of the five surviving daughters died in their thirties or forties, and only Mary, a nun, lived to be as old as her mother. By comparison with other Plantagenets, Eleanor's offspring seemed to have been particularly unfortunate. 
Henry III's five children all reached adulthood, as did all four of Edward II's and seven of Edward III's. Twelve. Less is known about humbler families, especially peasants and labourers, since records of their lives are sparse and unreliable. But child mortality among the poor was high, especially in years when harvests, uh, harvests were bad. Disastrous famines of 1314 to 21. Even at the best of times, almost 50% of children were likely to die before reaching 20. Could you imagine growing up in a village and then only half of you make it into adulthood? That's terrifying. Before puberty, girls had a much better chance of survival than boys because they were naturally stronger, but from then on the position was drastically reversed. So death in or immediately after childbirth reaped a terrible harvest among young and middle-aged women, raising their mortality rate well above that of their male contemporaries. The chances of survival undoubtedly varied with class, although expensive medical care may have done as much harm as good. The wives of better-off men were at least properly nourished before the ordeal of childbirth. So all kinds of factors affected a man's life expectancy, quite apart from disease. So among the poor, the commonest killers were probably hard work and short rations. In 1245, an average 20-year-old labourer on the Winchester estates could expect to live only another 24 years. Clerics lived longer. The average age of Christchurch Canterbury monks when they died was 51, as did nobles and landowners, provided they escaped hunting accidents and the hazards of war. Henry the Third, Edward the First, and Edward the Third was fired well into their sixties, like about a fifth of their subjects. Well, it just goes to show that leisure and relaxation goes a long way to a long life, people. In 1287, here on Sunday the 21st of December, a great tempest arose in the middle of the night. On the following Wednesday, there was a great inundation of the land by the sea. In the course of this flood and this great storm, 200 men were drowned in Horsley, Walsham, Martin, Hickling, and other neighbouring villages. In the town of Yarmouth, 100 men were drowned, while in Great Yarmouth, 60 feet of the stone wall of the cemetery collapsed under pressure of the sea flood. The wall of the priory was flattened to the ground, and the river rose so high that it reached the high altar of the church. In the same year at full moon, the moon appeared to be yellow, red, and also various other colours. Also at the same time, two suns were visible. Wow, a cataclysmic a storm. The Brides of Christ. Here, there's the mass in a convent, and Abbas holds the crozier. And uh, another nun with a large bunch of keys at her wrist is the cellarer. Franciscan nuns here called poor Claire's after the foundress at table while a nun reads to them. Do not wear a hair cloth or hedgehog skins, and do not beat yourselves with these things, or with a scourge of leather thongs. Do not cause yourself to bleed with holly or briars without the leave of your confessor, and do not at any one time flagellate yourselves too much. When you have let blood, do nothing that is irksome for three days, but talk with other maidens, and divert yourselves together with instructive tales. Because no man sees you, and you do not see any man, be content with your clothes, whether they be black or white. Only see that they are plain, warm, and well made. Beware of pride, ambition, presumption, envy, sloth, wrath, or hypocrisy, of a gloomy countenance, or sitting too long at the parlour window, of scornful laughter, or dropping crumbs, of spilling ale, or letting things grow mouldy, rotten, or rusty. Keep no animals, my sisters, except a cat. <laughs> I like that. Cats are okay. You can keep a cat. I have as many cats as you want running around the place. Cat comfort, that's fine. And I love out of all of these, some of these are pretty serious, but then there's also like, don't be dropping crumbs now. That's how we get rats. But also we got lots of cats, so maybe the situation resolves itself. So these instructions for female hermits come from the anonymous Ancran Wheel, written in the early 13th century, but they were popular throughout the later Middle Ages. Their blending of spiritual and practical advice was characteristic of what the religious life had to offer women at this time. The age of the profession to the nuns' vows was 16, but it was considered normal practice, particularly in aristocratic circles, for girls to enter convents when they were still children. Edward I's daughter Mary was only seven when she was sent to Amesbury Priory in Wiltshire to become a Benedictine nun. But that's terrible, when you're a young, young child trying to establish what you can and can't do in your freedoms and you're in such a strict place like a convent. Between 1216 and 1350, orders of nuns reached a peak of popularity and prosperity in England. 
with about 256 convents containing about 3,300 nuns and their sister order of canonesses, compared with about 14,000 monks, canons and friars. Most nunneries were small priories. Of the 19 great abbeys, most were Benedictine and most were south of the Thames. Their inhabitants were a mixture of saintly spiritual women who had joined because of their vocations, and those such as widows seeking a suitable retirement home, whose motives were more practical. Probably to get away as well from this cultural infatuation with being baby-making machines that are liable to die at any moment. I guess if I was given the choice, I think I would probably at the time consider being a nun, absolutely. Charges of immorality in nunneries were relatively rare, but sometimes dramatic. So in 1351, the poor but aristocratic priory of Cannington, Somerset, was visited by commissioners of the Bishop of Bath and Wells, who described it as little better than a brothel. Two of the nuns, Maud Bellum and Alice Northlode, were accustomed to hold long, suspicious meetings with two chaplains who were supposed to be ministering to their spiritual needs. A third nun, Joan Trimlet, was found with child, but not by the Holy Ghost. Yeah, it's not Jesus. The air hole intruded. The world intruded occasionally on even the most strictly cloistered nuns, sometimes violently. In 1304, the canonesses of Goring Priory, Oxfordshire, were disturbed when some men-at-arms rode their horses into the church, defiling it with hoofprints and dung. The men were in search of Isabella of Kent, a married woman staying in the convent, whom they pursued to the top of the belfry and then dragged away. Jews were compelled to wear two strips of yellow cloth six inches long and three inches wide, a precursor of Hitler's yellow star of David. Interesting, so persecution. Um, yeah, being, well, it is throughout the ages, isn't it? No Jew shall remain in England unless he perform the service of the king, and immediately any Jew shall be born, he shall serve us in some manner, declared Henry III in 1253 defining the sole function in government eyes of 13th century English Jews to provide the king with cash in the form of taxes and compulsory gifts or tallages. It was tacitly understood that they would meet his needs from the proceeds of lending money to his subjects at interest. And although usury was for strictly forbidden to Christians by the laws of church and state, Christian monarchs did not scruple to profit from it at a second hand. The Department of Government, the Exchequer of the Jews, existed to keep careful record of their transactions so that the king knew exactly how much he could extort from them. The Jews weren't merely the king's financial agents, they were also literally his physical property, prized for their business expertise and treated rather like valuable milch cows. They could be lent, given or mortgaged to royal favourites for exploitation. At the beginning of the 13th century, nearly a seventh of the king's income was provided by the heavy taxes levied on the Jews from the cradle to the grave and beyond. The Crown was entitled to confiscate a dead Jew's entire property on the hypocritical grounds that it had been acquired by sinful activities. In practice, the heir was also allowed sufficient funds to continue in business and so to keep cash flowing into the royal coffers. For the same purpose, Jews were privileged to pursue their debts through the royal law courts. Quite equally important, the King's Jews could expect royal protection against attacks by Christians. Because they enabled the king to raise money without consulting his subjects, the Jews were particularly disliked by baronial opponents of the crown. And moreover, in the increasingly paranoid religious atmospheres of the 13th century, they were attacked as enemies of Christ and subjected to a host of anti-Semitic regulations. Forced to wear a distinguishing badge of shame, they were forbidden to eat with Christians, employ Christian service, or enter churches. And at Easter, when anti-Jewish fervor was at its height, they were prohibited from leaving their homes. The church didn't hesitate to exploit the darker strain of anti-Semitism apparent in periodic discoveries that Jews had richly murdered Christian children. The fires of prejudice were kept aglow at the shrines of St. William of Norwich and little St. Hugh of Lincoln, both allegedly infant victims of Jewish conspiracies. The downfall of the king's Jews was brought about by the king himself, rather than his subjects' prejudice, and resulted from royal policies that destroyed their livelihood while exploiting them without mercy. 1269, already impoverished by gravely excessive taxation, they were relegated to their status of pawnbrokers, able to accept only movable personal property and not land as security for loans. Then at the beginning of Edward I's reign in 1275, they were forbidden to lend money at interest and at the same time effectively prevented from becoming merchants. Jews who traded illegally in silver from clicked coins were brutally punished. Nearly 300 were hanged in 1275. 
1279, yet they continued to be heavily taxed until it became clear they could pay no more. On the 18th of July 1290, the fast of the 9th of Arb in the Jewish calendar, and the anniversary of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, Edward decreed that all Jews be expelled from England. He seized the property they left behind and took over the debt still due to them. The expulsion was carried out with the comparative humanity, and outgoing Jews were assiduously protected from attack. Seamen who abandoned a cargo of refugees to drown on a sandbank were themselves taken and executed. The first wholesale banishment of the Jews during the medieval period, Edward's action was important for his future. His example was followed by France in 1306 and with savage thoroughness by Spain in the 1490s. Tossed about from pillar to post at the whims of people as the outgroup. It's terrible, isn't it? Really, really terrible. Here's some chronicle from 1291. Edward I summoned his nobles and the clergy, and held a parliament the fortnight after Easter at Norham, which lay on the border between England and Scotland. He arranged for a meeting to be held there between clerics with expert knowledge of civil and canon law. A large number of religious uh, men with their chronicles, several bishops, and the Archbishop of York, John Le Romain, to decide once and for all who should have superior lordship over the Kingdom of Scotland. After they made historical inquiries, and had been questioned severally and separately, according to their consciences, all declared that superior lordship over Scotland belonged to the King of England. King Edward I therefore called the Scottish prelates and nobles before him in the parish church of Norham on the 10th of May of the same year. Extracts were read out from the important chronicles, privileges, and other papal and royal writings to show how the kings of Scotland had in the past paid homage to the kings of England and had called them lords. The Scots were allowed a short time to make their reply. When they came to confer, they were clearly reluctant to accept this, so the King of England swore by St. Edward the Confessor that he would have the rights of his kingdom and of the crown of St. Edward, or would pursue those rights here even at the price of his own death. But the Scottish nobles did not have the power to deny the King of England's claim, so they acknowledged his lordship. Morning, a queen. Eleanor Cross of Geddington in Northamptonshire, and a um, effigy of Eleanor of Castile, the first in England to be gilded in bronze. So in 1290, Eleanor of Castile died at Harby in Lincolnshire. Her entrails were buried at Lincoln Cathedral and her heart at the Blackfriars in London. The rest of her body was interred in Westminster Abbey. So this multiple burial practice, which was becoming increasingly popular amongst royal families, ensured that her soul would have the heartful prayers of the Dominicans at the Blackfriars, as well as the Benedict as well as the Benedictines at Westminster. Kind of gross. But this is interesting because I used to live near one of these twelve monumental stone crosses erected to mark the twelve stages of her sad final journey from Lincoln to Westminster, only three of which, at Walton, Northampton and Geddington, survive. So I used to grow up in a county called Bedfordshire, and there is a town called Dunstable. At the crossroads is a site where one of the Eleanor Crosses used to be. It's now unfortunately just marked by a template, like a, a little, um, a little sign now. But of course I now live, funnily enough, near Waltham. And there is of course Waltham Cross near Waltham Abbey, where this is located. They were essentially French in concept and design, based on the similar Montjoys which commemorated the places where St. Louis' body rested on its way from Aigues Mortes and Provence to its burial in Saint-Denis. For whether or not they represent the depth of Edward's grief over the loss of his queen, or simply the inevitable Plantagenet urge to keep up with the Capetians, it's unclear. He ensured his wife should have a, a splendid monument in Westminster Abbey. Earlier 13th century tomb effigies were all carved. The one of King John at Worcester, calmly and passive in his death, is in Purbeck marble. Other distinctive types in Purbeck or stone show a series of knights fully dressed for battle as if still alive. They are often twisted into awkward cross-legged positions attempting to draw their swords. The group that includes William Marshall in the nave of the Temple Church in London as an example. Other subjects peer anxiously into an uncertain future, like William Longsword at Salisbury. They're all curiously disturbing, as if none of them can break out of the stone that holds them fast in the final struggle with death. Unlike them, 
Eleanor lies calmly and elegantly with a Castilian gravity. Also unlike them, she's not carved in stone, but gilded bronze, the first full-size effigy to be made in mess this metal in medieval England. The artist, a London goldsmith called William Dorrell, made a similar figure of Henry III at the same time. In both cases, gold florins, specially imported from Lucca and melted down, were used to gild the bronze. Stunning. We have an account in 1292. When King Edward I returned north to Berwick upon Tweed on the 1st of November, he ordained that 50 distinguished Scotsmen who were experts in the law should be appointed as arbiters. These men were appointed, and the king added to their number 30 Englishmen whom he had chosen. He made them swear to consider the claims of all the candidates and to bring the business of the Scottish succession to a satisfactory conclusion. They awarded the right to succeed to the Scottish throne to John Balliol, since he claimed it by descent from the eldest daughter of David, Earl of Huntingdon. The King of England approved this decision and handed over to John Balliol the Kingdom of Scotland with complete power, saving the homage and fealty due to him. On the 30th of November, the Feast of St. Andrew, John Balliol was made King of Scotland in the usual Scottish manner. At the Monastery of Scone, there was a huge stone set in the church near the high altar, hollow and shaped in the form of a round seat. It was the custom of future kings to be placed on it, as it were, in the matter of coronation. The task of enthroning the new King of Scotland in this manner belonged by hereditary right to the Earl of Fife. The King had to swear that he would rule justly, defend the Holy Mother Church and his subjects, and would make good laws and maintain those already in force until his death. When the new King was thus placed on the Stone of Scone, a solemn mass was celebrated, and the King remained seated on the stone except during the elevation of the host. So here are some drawings of John Balliol and Robert Bruce each grasping the flag of Scotland. A domestic instance of family support is the coat of arms embroidered on each wife's death dress. So in 1290, the eight-year-old Margaret, Queen of Scots, fell ill on her way from Norway to Scotland and died. The throne of Scotland was open to whoever could successfully prosecute a claim to it. There were 13 claimants in the great cause, all of whom agreed to submit to Edward I's judgment. The King of England had a reputation as a legalist, and the power and influence to make a decision stick. Two Anglo-Scottish barons emerged as the main contenders, John Balliol, who appealed to feudal law and claimed direct descent through the female line, and Robert Bruce, who argued from imperial law that he, as the next surviving male descendant of David I, should succeed. After lengthy pleadings and consultations with lawyers, Scottish barons and churchmen, it would be pronounced in favour of Balliol, who, as King John, swore fealty. However, there is soon caught between the demands of Edward I and a growing mood of national resentment. His hand, forced by his principal counsellors, John, defied Edward. Edward I invaded, forcing John to abdicate, and proceeded to rule the country directly in 1296. Many of the Scottish leaders, backed by the community of the realm, did not acknowledge the abdication, and Scotland's government was continued independently in King John's name. The resistance was successful at first, but eight years later, in 1304, Edward suppressed the last vestiges of the popular rising. His characteristic, charismatic leader, William Wallace, was hunted down with single-minded vindictiveness, captured and taken to London. He was given a show trial and executed with full contemporary barbarity. I think it's outside um, one of the hospitals, St. I think it might be St. Guy's Hospital. Or St. Thomas, I can't remember which one it is. But his um, memorial is outside there because that's the site where he was hung, drawn, and quartered. Most Scottish barons made their peace with Edward by this time. Robert Bruce, Earl of Carrick, the grandson of the 1290 claimant, was one of them, submitted to the King of England in the hope that his claim might be reviewed, but his adherence was short lived. Scotland was no longer an independent kingdom, but a subject land under Edward's firm and direct rule, and to overthrow the English yoke, Bruce decided to prosecute his own claim to the throne. The support of John Comyn, head of a family with a long tradition of opposition to England, was central to Bruce's plans, and the two men met in Greyfriars Church in Dumfries in February 1306. However, to Comyn, as to many Scots, John Balliol was still the lawful king, and Bruce failed to win him over. Bruce and his supporters murdered Comyn, and mobilised support with a rapidity which suggests advanced planning. On 25th of March 1306, Bruce was crowned in the Abbey Church at Scone. 
and although King Robert was excommunicated for murder in common, he had the robust backing of the Scottish Church, whose long fight for independence from the seat of York had given ecclesiastics a head to start in developing patriotic further. At this stage, however, there was no support for Bruce from the wider community of the realm, or at least from the barons who mattered. The new king was soundly defeated by English forces, and his family and friends were nearly exterminated. Robert himself went into hiding, and at the end of 1306 it looked as though his rising, like the one led by Wallace, had also been suppressed. Robert's remarkable recovery is the stuff of fairy tales, rather than of history. In early 1307 he returned to his family power base in Galloway and began rallying support. This time his campaign against the English was waged with guerrilla tactics, at which it was to prove unsurpassed. When in July 1307 Edward I died in pursuit of the Scottish king, the tide turned in Robert's favour. Here we have Philip the Fair, shown as larger and higher than his nobles, greatly increased the power and influence of the French throne. So here in 1294, this year, the King of England gave back all his lands in Gascony and other regions to Philip IV, the King of France. But before he did so, Philip promised faithfully and by oath taken in the presence of many of the nobles in France, in particular the Duke of Burgundy and the Archbishop of Reims, that after 40 days he would restore all these lands into the possession of the King of England without retaining any. There was even some preliminary discussion concerning a proposal that the King of England should marry Blanche, the sister of the King of France, and that he should receive back said lands as a marriage portion. A day was fixed in the fortnight after the step of the King of England and the King of France to meet at Amion and settle their disagreements, and for the King of England and Blanche to contract their marriage. It was also promised that the King of England should have safe conduct on his journey there. Before Easter, however, it was reported to Edward the first that Blanche, the sister of the King of France, would not have him as a husband. Edward would have been tricked if he had gone to the meeting at Amiens, as was brought clearly to light by subsequent events. For this reason, the King of England did not attend the meeting. In the same year, Philip IV, angry because the King of England would not come to Amiens, and because he was therefore not able to put into effect his plot against it, would return to Paris. The Parliament then gathered in Paris, the King of France, seeing that he had already had the lands of Edward I in his hands, but that all the military strength of the King of England lay outside Gascony and these lands at this time. Philip scorned his oath to restore them to Edward after forty days, and instead procured a judgment depriving England, Edward not only of Gascony but all of his French dominions. It even decreed it publicly that Edward should be captured because he was an enemy of France and of all French people. In June the first, Edward the first held his Parliament in London over a course of a few days. There it was granted and provided that the king should go overseas with his army to recover and defend those of his lands which were now in the power of the King of France. The men of the sink ports and other seamen were empowered to guard the sea and to capture their enemies, including all ships from Sluys and Flanders, and any sailing from Sluys to Gascony. William Leyburn was made admiral of all the men of the sink ports and of all the other mariners and seamen within the rule of the King of England. Bernard Cesaire, the Bishop of Pamier, wrote of Philip IV, the King of France is like an owl, the most beautiful of birds, but worth nothing. Damning with faint praise there. Well, not even faint praise, it's pretty obvious damning. He's the most handsome of men, but he stares fixedly in silence. He is neither man nor beast, he is a statue. <laughs> By contrast, William de Nogare, the king's leading advisor from 1303 to 1313, portrayed Philip as full of grace, charity, piety, and mercy, always following truth and justice, never a detraction in his mouth, fervent in the faith, religious in his life, building basilicas and engaging in works of piety. Philip was indeed outwardly pious. His donations to the church outstripped even those of his grandfather Louis the Ninth, in whose memory many of them were made. In 1297, Louis was declared a saint by Pope Boniface the Eighth, and Philip showed great devotion to his cult. But Louis's canonization took effect at the height of Philip's first great dispute with Boniface over clerical taxation, and although much deserved, was conceded by the Pope for largely political reasons. In 1301, another dispute broke out, which ended only when in 1303, William de Nogare and his followers sacked the papal powers at Anagni and frightened Boniface to death. Philip was subsequently, in 1314, able to suppress the mighty order of the Templars and take over many of their lands and monies for himself, virtually unopposed by Pope Clement V. His unprecedented dealings with the church scandalized and horrified contemporaries, and although 
religious councillors have often been blamed. It's probable that the king himself directed events and remained firmly in control throughout. His belief in the power of the French monarchy far outweighing any religious considerations. He was an effective and successful king. Under his rule, France reached its medieval apogee of power and prestige. It became preoccupied with reducing the authority of Edward I of England and Gascony, and in 1294 a costly war broke out between them. The Scots allied with Philip and continued until 1303. Little was resolved by the peace negotiations, but the marriage of Isabella, Philip's daughter, to the future Edward II was arranged. Philip also tried to reduce Guy of Dampierre, court uh, Count of Flanders, who sided with Edward to obedience. Philip's army was heavily defeated by the Flemish townsmen in 1302, but later in his reign he managed to take over several Flemish castellanes from Guy's successor, Robert of Bethune. He also extended royal authority to the other great French lordships, such as Burgundy. He called great national assemblies to back some of his more dubious actions, such as his treatment of the church, and his administrators brought about major developments in government, finance and law. But his reign ended badly. His attempts to raise ever greater sums of money produced baronial opposition, and the wives of two of his sons were accused of adulterous liaisons and cast into prison. Despite these setbacks, he's remembered as one of the great rulers of France. And I think with that, we can end our journey for now and look forward to one more part in the life and times of Edward the First. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to having you join me next time for more Chronicles of the Age of Chivalry. Until then, 